Um, All right, friends, welcome to, to Kabbalah and Coffee. So we're getting a new week started, and I don't know of a better way to get a week started than by studying Kabbalah, by studying Jewish mystical wisdom, Jewish spirituality, a way to remind ourselves of our purpose, our calling in this world, and to really get, um, kind of expand our consciousness really before we jump into all of the nitty gritty of the week. And I want to liken it to what the mystics tell us about really our daily schedules. Um, as many of you know, in Jewish tradition, there is a, a daily tradition to meditate and pray before, before we engage in work. And this has a fundamental difference or a fundamental impact on how our day goes. And it, it makes a fundamental difference based on how we start the day. So if we start our day with you know, the news, which is typically gloomy, and with, I don't know, other physical kind of um, attachments. So then our day is kind of getting off to, to one sort of style. But when we start the day with study and meditation and prayer, it's a completely different, it's a completely different day. Um, you know, as we start off something, that's the way things typically go. The way something trends is the way it typically heads. In, uh, in, in Kabbalah, there's an example, a beautiful parable brought from the example of a tree. You take, and we've had this experience many times because I've worked with um, Trees Atlanta on planting trees around the city, um, volunteering with Trees Atlanta, and we've had Trees Atlanta and other city groups plant trees around the neighborhood here where we live in Virginia Highlands. And I've, I've been able to see kind of how, and firsthand experience, how you plant a tree. You need to plant the tree straight up because <laughs> if you plant it a little sideways, it's not going to be good for anybody, right? Imagine if there's a tree, you know, on the, I don't know what it's called, I guess, um, in between, the si between your sidewalk and the street where they plant the trees, right? Atlanta, by the way, for anyone in Atlanta, you know how many trees there are around. This is like a treescape with a city inside. Kind of, it's like a tree canopy with the city, which this time of year, many of us pay the price with allergies, et cetera, but that's for another conversation. The Kabbalah of pollen, which is for another conversation. I don't know what that would be, by the way, but on some level, we would have to pull that off. But getting back to this point, it's, um, it's important, vitally important when you're planting a tree to make sure that the tree is growing straight up, that it's headed in the right direction. Because if the tree is askew even a little bit, well, then that could cause a, uh, a great leaning in the future. The other example brought in Kabbalah is, again, a planting example is if you take a seed and you cause a defect in the seed, you know, like a scratch or something or some sort of defect in the seed, it could have far reaching implications with regard to what that seed produces. So the point is that the most critical time to get something right is in the beginning. This is true with education. It's true with trees. It's true on many different seeds, on many different levels. Getting it right at the beginning is so important. And that brings me back to how we start our day. Kabbalah teaches that every single day we should study, meditate on what we studied, pray, which prayer is not, just to clarify, Prayer is not when we open up our laundry list and ask God, all right, God, here's what I need today. Um, although that's part of it, that's not the essence of prayer. Some of you took my course from a few years ago called The Art of Prayer. And in that course, we talked about how prayer is fundamentally about us opening our consciousness, expanding our perspective of the universe and recognizing that God is in control. And so part of that is turning to God and requesting what we need. But the foundation is to say it again and again in different formats, different prayers, different, you know, different articulations, but the same core concept that we are believing, that we are surrendering, in fact, to the, to the, to the fact that God is in control of us, of the universe, of our fates, etc. So when we start the day with prayer, 
sorry, start the day with study and meditation and prayer, we can handle everything else, right? So life throws us a, cur a curveball. All right, we have a solid foundation. We have solid roots today. And in a very similar way, we start the week with Kabbalah, studying Kabbalah and coffee together. So we start the week by anchoring ourselves into deeper truths, into spiritual um, ideals and ideas that keep us grounded so that no matter what the week ahead may bring, right, we have a way of being centered and a way of being maintaining our equilibrium despite all that life brings us. Okay, so I'm glad that's a long way of me saying that I'm glad that you're with me here Sunday morning to study Kabbalah so that we can anchor ourselves together um, with Jewish mystical and spiritual wisdom so that the week ahead will flow that much smoother. All right, and I know anecdotally, I will say, I know that many of you have given me feedback about how impactful these Sunday morning classes have been in your lives to be able to keep you focused and centered and grounded. And then even without being able to necessarily put, put our finger on it, just things flow a little bit easier. When, all, when things don't turn out the way we would like them to turn out, we're able to manage to deal with them perhaps in a more even keeled fashion, in a, in a higher fashion because of our anchoring. We should never underestimate the power of starting a week or starting a day off and on the right foot. It's so, so, so powerful. All right, so let's talk about today's topic, which is thirsty light. Light that is thirsty, and this will make sense by the end of today's class. So if it doesn't make sense yet, stay with me. Um, even if it does make sense to you, stay with me. Um, okay, so last week, I just want to rewind a little bit so that we have a running start. Last week, I spoke about the the, the truth in life that oftentimes we see that good guys finish last. It's not gender specific, but good people seem to suffer in this world. You know, bad things happen to good people. And the flip side of that, we talked about last week, is the idea that on the other side, it seems like sometimes not so good people are, are enjoying life, are living large, are having a great time, right? And being very successful at it. So this evokes core, you could call it philosophical questions. I would call it spiritual philosophical questions. The question being, if God runs the world and if God is good and God is all powerful, and God is all-knowing. So how does God allow for evil to prosper to such um, a high degree? Why does evil prosper? Why do evildoers find success? Why does that happen? There should be, in other words, the premise of the question is, there should be some sort of mechanism, right? Where the moment a line is crossed, boom, you're cut off, right? That's it. No more energy flow, no more, no more blessing. So to really understand this, essentially to understand how energy, which is spiritual energy, which is converted into physical blessings, how that whole mechanism works. Last week, we segued into a conversation about creation, specifically about the attribute of malchut, which is the last of the 10 Svirot that plays such a critical role in the creative process. So if you were with me last week and uh, you hear me saying the word Malchut now, so it'll, it'll strike a familiar chord. If you've studied about Malchut before and didn't join us last week, so it's also familiar. But I want to go over a drop, a little bit of what we said last week, just again so that we're all on the same page as we begin today's new conversation. Again, the key to all of this is understanding that what I like to call Kabbalah's law, the Kabbalistic law of gravity, right? So the, the physics law of gravity is, who was it, Newton, that got hit in the head with an apple? Is that the story? Yes, was that how gravity was discovered? 
And I don't know how gravity wasn't discovered until then. It's not like people didn't drop things before and they didn't go up, but be that as it may, Sir Isaac Newton somehow, right? That was his name, I think so. Figured out this whole thing about, about gravity, et cetera. By the way, there's Kabbalah on gravity, a, an unbelievable insight from the mystics about how gravity works, which is mind blowing. And it ties into some of the latest discoveries about gravity, which today's class is not about. But what is the Kabbalistic law of gravity? It is that anything that exists down here originated up there. I'll say that again. It's a very simple formula. It's very simple. Just like if you were sitting under an apple tree and an apple bonked you in the head, you would know that it didn't just start on your head. It's originated in the tree, right? That's how gravity works from top down. The same thing is true with the spiritual law of gravity. Again, anything that exists on our level, on our plane of the universe, in other words, in this physical world, if something exists, it has a spiritual source from whence it fell. So it descended. Everything down here starts off in a pure spiritual energy form and then comes down through this elaborate process of the light and the energy flowing through the various worlds, dimensions, chambers, until it gets here, until that energy materializes into something concrete, which then gives birth or gives rise to all of the physical stuff that we have around here. So in short, anything that you can, we're all in a space, right? I doubt anyone is joining us from a vacuum. So if you're in a, if you're, you're in a space in a room or outside, wherever you are, look around, look around and look at, look at the stuff around you and know that although you're looking at physical stuff, it has everything has a spiritual origin and not only once upon a time, a spiritual origin, but there is spiritual energy, spiritual light that is flowing through it right now, even in its very physical manifestation and form. Some of you jo have uh, joined us in the past for our Kabbalah and Coffee series that we did. This is probably two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. We did it on the section of Tanya called Shahra Yichar Ve'amunah, which is the gate of unity and faith, where the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, talks about how all of creation, all of existence, is powered by divine characters. I don't mean like <laughs> Bob and Tim. No, I mean divine characters, i.e. letters. The divine language powers everything. Even in its physical state, everything is enlivened by divine energy. That's an important prerequisite for understanding what we'll talk about Malchut today and beyond. So again, the objective, the larger objective is to understand how the mechanics of the universe, how, how the universe works on a spiritual level, the me spiritual mechanics of the universe, where we're in energy and light flows downward to power our universe, which is going to help us understand how this seeming glitch of evil prospering occurs. That's where we're going with this. Ultimately, we're going to determine that even though evil does prosper on some level, it's not a good, it's not a good choice, but we'll get to all of that ultimately in our journey. But to, to get there, it's important to know that the energy and light flows from above to below to produce everything that we have here. And Malchut plays a pivotal role in this process. Why? As I said before and last week, because Malchut is the lowest of the Sefirot energies, and thus it is the closest, most the word I'm looking for. It is the most familiar energy to that which is being produced. I'm going to share my screen with you. I want to show you a form of the chart of Sefirot that I don't usually share this one. I usually share the one that has, um, that has translations under it. But this one is fine for our purposes today because it lists the various energies starting from Keter. Now, 
so as some of you may know, there are 11, sorry, 10 sefirot. If you count the circles here, you'll count 11. The reason is because there is keter and there is dat. And what Kabbalah typically says is that when you count keter, you don't count dat. When you count dat, you don't count keter. But it's kind of Clark Kent and Superman. But, lahavdil, but we are, um, in this case, we have everything here just for the full depiction. So you have keter at the top, chachma bina dat, chesed vivura teferet, netzach, hod yesod, and malchut. So malchut is all the way at the bottom of the totem pole. And the reason why I love this depiction specifically is because you have this, and I don't know what shape this is um, in geometry, but look from Keter through Yisod. You see like the Keter through Yisod? It goes boom, 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 right? It has that kind of, that shape to it. It looks like a fancy mezuzah case perhaps. Right, so it's got that kind of like sh 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 shape to it. Malchut is the energy that sticks out. Malchut is the is the sphira that protrudes from the body, if you will, of this schematic of sfirot, and it's kind of like, oh, you. <laughs> Not that anyone's looking at malchut like that, but malchut is fundamentally accessible relatable, geared toward the other, the outsider. So whereas all of the other energies exist primarily for self, malchut exists primarily for other, which by the way, I didn't mention this last week, but it's very important that I mention this, which by the way, is very um, in sync with the name of malchut. Because what is malchut? Malchut means literally, malchut means, you know what? Unmute yourself and tell me what Malchut literally translates as. What is Malchut? Majesty. Majesty. What else? What is a what is a melech? A melech. What is it? The translation of melech? King. King. So Malchut is kingship. Malchut is kingship. Malchut is sovereignty. But think about what that means. Malchut is kingship. You can only be a king. If you have an other, if you have subjects, if there's someone else, if it's just you, you can't be a king. So malchut, the malchut energy, which is all the way at the bottom, almost, not almost, it needs an other world. It needs something else to be melech, to be king over. So the way we describe this in the past and last week as well is the following. Every world has this same schematic. So let's talk about the world of Atsilut, the world of emanation, which is the highest of the spiritual worlds. So it has all of these energies and it has Malchut. And Malchut, as I just explained, Malchut is all about being king, being the top, which implies over something else. But what is the else? So malchut is the energy that produces, that helps um, produce or generate the next world, the next realm down. So this would be the energy um, formula in the upper world. And beneath it would be the energy formula of the lower world. And the malchut of the upper world forms the keter of the lower world. So if we were able to stack, and I can't do this right now on the fly, but if we were able to stack these energies in vertical alignment, so what you would see in, in depicting various worlds, what you would have is this world A, let's just, to make it easier, let's do world A and B and C and D. So world A would have Keter through Malchut, and then world B would have again Keter through Malchut, but that malchut of the, of the upper world would align with the keter of the lower world because indeed that is what spawns the lower world. Here's the point. What helps create the created universe? And that is, the answer to that is, this energy of malchut. Why? Because it's the lowest, it's the most relatable, and the way we described it last week, it, it contains the divine energy 
that is the most contracted, the most um, diminished, so that it can produce a world beneath it that is much lower in level. So the higher world, the world of Atzilot, world A, is a world of emanation, a world of spirituality, a world of divinity, where all that sense really is God. The next world down is called world B, is actually Bria, the world of creation. And suddenly now you have a sense of other, a sense of the created beings. Well, how do you get from God consciousness to created consciousness, uh, even, even subtly, you get there through a diminishing of the light. So Malchut is where the light is diminished to the great within, within the upper world. It's where the light is diminished in a, a, a to, to the greatest degree of, of this within the schematic. And since the light is diminished, it's able to create something that has a little bit more self-awareness than it had. So essentially this is the process of the light being diminished and being concealed until it produces something else. This is what Malchut is, and that is what Malchut does, which takes us to the conversation today. So one of the euphemisms, euphemisms, I think I said that right, of Malchut is shame. Not the English word shame. Not like Malchut has anything to be embarrassed about, but Malchut is called in Hebrew, shame, which means name. Why is Malchut called name? Because a name is not the essence of a person. The name is but a glimmer of manifestation from that individual. So just to explain what I mean by glimmer of manifestation. There's who you are. And you don't need a name for yourself. For your own existence, you don't need a name. You're doing fine without a name. Who are you to yourself? I, right? The way you relate to yourself, let me just make this simpler. The way I relate to myself is as an I, right? I want, I need, I love, I am, etc. I. So what do I need a name for? I need a name for you. Right. So that you can identify me. I so my name serves really as a forward facing um, utility. It's not for me. It's for you. It's not for self. It's for the other. In a similar way, Malchut is not for that world itself. Malchut exists for the other, for the world beneath it. Does that make sense? What I just said? Yes. Yeah, okay. I got one. I got one thumbs up. We're, right. Thank you, David. So, so the rabbi? Yes, Yaakov. So there the this uh Sephira, you're saying obviously there is there's two set, at least two sets of Sephira. One is the uh the spiritual realm and then the second is the the earth. There are many dimensions in between. But yeah. yes, it's essentially it's a successive um Roll, roll out of more self-identifying, more self-aware, you know, less divine aware, more self-aware worlds and realms that ultimately um, end up with our physical world in which we're completely self-aware, almost completely self-aware and very, very little divine aware without a lot of work, self-work, meditation, contemplation, study, etc. But the nature of this world is self-awareness and lack of divine awareness. But yes, essentially, if we were trying to simplify this, we would talk about spiritual and physical, two worlds, and you have the spiritual that produces the physical, and how do you go from spiritual to physical, or in the language of Kabbalah, how would you go from infinite light to a finite universe? You would That would happen through the lowest dimension of that infinite light space, which is I mean, it would still be infinite, but that's why it, it takes a few different iterations of this to, to, to end up with a physical universe. But essentially, it takes the lowest dimension of that higher realm, which is Malchut, which is all about the other, which is all about 
otherness and, and, and recognizing and honoring the other of the other, that is what produces the lower limited realm. Yeah. So, um, Yaakov, I'm loving the, the nature hike. Beautiful. It really um, evokes Kabbalah and meditation. It's behind Chabad of Kab. Uh, Look at that. They, they call it Lake, Lake Tashlif, which is kind of limited because <laughs> that means it's got one use per year, but uh, I think it's Tashlif and everything else. <laughs> I, would call it, I would call it Lake Afilta, a place where you can go get filter fishing. Anyway, yeah, I, saw, back. I saw had two, two pieces of uh, pickles on either side swimming and a carrot slice on its back. There you go. Exactly. All right. So back to our story. So Malchut is called shame. A name, shame in Hebrew is name. Why? Because Malchut is all about facing the other. Malchut, just like a name, is about the other. Here's how you can identify me, right? So, 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 sorry, just like a name is about the other, this is how you can identify me. Malchut is about the other. And that's how we ended off um, last week. I want to go over that little section in the text. And then we're going to jump into the new text, which speaks about, which is today's focus, which speaks about the feelings of Malchut, right? Because we can look at these as disembodied energies or just energies that just have a utility and, and they're just pre-programmed, or we can look at them as, as energies that, are, that have some sort of feeling about who they are and what they do. And then it's going to open up a completely different level of understanding, which is where we're going today with this. All right, so let me share my screen. And actually, hold on one second. Let me do something else. Um, let's, how do I do this? Window. Hold on, give me a moment, just figuring out how to, there we go. Oh, cool. Okay, I have tabs here. Good, this is good to know for me. Um, I am going to share my screen in just a moment. Give me one second. Okay. Ready. I want to start I want to start with this line in the middle of this paragraph from the essence. I hope you can see can you see my mouse moving right here? Yes. All right, so right there in that line. From the essence of the infinite light there could not be the creation of the worlds and finite creatures. For infinite and finite have no common ground, as is explained at length elsewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Only from radiance, which is malchut, did the worlds come into being. In other words, not from the infinite light itself, but from the lowest point of light in that continuum malchut, which juts out from the rest, which is all about other, which is not infinite light, but radiance of that light. It's not like the source of the light. It's rather just the ray of light that shines from the source. It's that from Malchut, the worlds can come into being. Therefore, Malchut is commonly called name. And this is what we find in Kabbalah all over the place, that Malchut is synonymous with name. Why? And he cites a verse, as in his name was proclaimed king over them. So name is king. Name and king are, are connected. Why? He explains, a name is no more than an extension and not the essence. It's just, at, ju sorry, just as a person's name is not the person's essence. So when we say name, what, we're, what, we, what we mean is it's not you, it's just your name. It's not me, it's just my name. It's just the way that you relate to me. It's the part of me that you can hold on to as a handle and say, ah, oh, right? Shmerel, Beryl, Yankel, right? It's not the essence of the person. It's just the name of the person. 
Malchut is not the essence of the infinite light. It's the ray of light that we can hold on to. Similarly, here we go, bottom line. Similarly, the vitality that gives life to the existence of the worlds, Malchut, is merely a name and radiance. It's not the essence of the light. It's not the infinite light. It's not the full measure of the spherot energies, it's just the lowest dimension, malchut, which is called name, and it's only the radiance, not the source light, it's a ray of light. Think about the difference between the sun and a ray that finds itself coming in through your kitchen window and is landing on the floor, right? That ray of light that comes through and is now on the floor, right, of, of your kitchen, that, rate, that little amount of light is incomparable to the full measure of light in the source, right, in the sun. But it's still connected with the sun. It's still, it's still part of that continuum, but it's very far reduced from its original potency. The same thing is true with Malchut. Malchut is, of course, connected with the source, but Malchut is the most reduced measure of light from that original source, and thus it is now is now capable of creating a lower realm, a lower realm of existence where the light is ever more hidden. Okay, and now we ascribe an awareness and emotional disposition to the ray itself. Okay, this, if you're not familiar, if you, if, if, if you haven't studied a lot of Kabbalah, this may sound strange, but understand this, we're going to support it with many, many source texts, as well as verses in the coming chapters. So stay with me on this. We are now going, again, I'm just going to say it again. We're going to now ascribe an awareness, intellectual awareness, and an emotional feeling about Tamalchut, about its position. Here we go. And, and you can probably see already in this little header, a ray that yearns. Essentially, what we're going to say is the light that is this ray, this little, this little light, super small, little diminished, right? Light, malchut, desires to go back to its source, not to keep on extending. Here we go. Now, the source of all existence, as we just said, is a mere ray. It's a ray of light. Originally, all absorbed within its source. So this ray of light, this malchut energy, which continues to shine forward and create worlds, that ray of light originally was all absorbed within its source. That ray, ju just like with the sun, right? So the ray of light coming through the window, through the blinds in your kitchen, that little ray of light that when you put your hand on the, on the kitchen floor, maybe as a drop warm, but it's not like, you know, super, it's not like touching the sun, right? That little ray of light that originally came from the source, from the sun, but is now in your kitchen, a little bit, little diminished ray. So that ray originated in the sun. And at some point it was in the sun. And then it's extending. Same thing is true with Malchut with the spiritual light, the divine light, that is the source of existence. It all started in the source. It was originally all absorbed. It was subsumed. It was melded and melted within its source. As stated in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which is one of the Midrashic texts, it says over there, before, listen to this, before creation, Okay, so before anything else existed, there existed only he, God, and his name. Remember what name is? Remember what name is? Name is Malchot. Name is the ray of light that serves as the source of... Name is the diminished light that spawns creation. So look at what Pirkei Rebbe Lezer says. That before any otherness existed, there was only he and his name. In other words... There was this potential for the ray of light, but at that point, before creation, the name existed within himself. It's kind of like 
I think I gave it this example last week. If you're alone on a desert island, so you don't need a name. So your potential for name exists within yourself because it doesn't, you don't actually have a name that anyone is using. There's no other. So that potential for a name to be recognized by the other, to be you know, identified by an other, that potential is there, but it's all within yourself because you're not extending it in this moment because there's no other to extend that to. I don't know if that makes sense. To me, it makes sense. But let's get back to the original point here, that before creation, there's only God and his name. This refers, let's continue inside. This refers to the name and ray, Malchut, as it was absorbed within the essence of the infinite light before creation took place. The implication here is that before creation takes place, so all of the energies are there, but in a compacted or self-absorbed, I don't mean that in a narcissistic way, but in a self-absorbed manner. So malchut, which ultimately will, as things unfold, extend and create lower worlds, lower realms, more self-identifying realms, before that whole thing unfolds, it was in its source. And with creation, this race separated from its source in order to vivify creation. So before creation, the ray of light, malchut, divine name, etc., was subsumed within its source. At the point of creation, it now extends outward to create. Listen to this conclusion. Therefore, last line on this page. Therefore, this ray, again, this is malchut, this ray is constantly in a state of ratzo. What is ratzo? Ratzo means yearning, thirst, desire, yearning. It's in a constant state of ratzo. Let's continue the sentence. Why? For it desires and longs to be absorbed and united with the infinite light, its root and source. Stated simply, Malchut fondly reminisces about the old times, about the old days. Ah, remember when I was subsumed within the source and now here I am, extended all the way out, kind of in my own space. It yearns to be back into its source. So, Imagine if we were to do the same to the ray of light that comes through the narrow slats of your kitchen um, blinds. It's a little ray of light that comes through in your kitchen and you see it, it's shining, it's illuminating part of your kitchen floor. And imagine that ray of light had an awareness, a self-awareness. And the ray of light would, have, would say to itself, wow, how the mighty have fallen. I'm in some person's kitchen on the floor. I used to be in the source in the sun. You see that big sun? I used to be there. And now, ah, it's been garnished. I'm nothing. I'm just a little ray that somebody steps on. Right? Just a little ray. Maybe a cat will play with it. I don't know if cat, maybe they like following light. They do like light if it's just sitting. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, I, I used to be the sun essentially. I was part of the sun. And now look at me. Look how the mighty have fallen. If we were to ascribe a consciousness and an emotional capacity to the ray of light, it might say this very same thing that we're saying about Malchut. Malchut is the divine energy the part of the light that goes down into creation. It's the lowest, the most diminished. And what does it want? It yearns to be back in the source. Yeah, Tony, go ahead. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, sure. I, don't, I don't want to digress from all this wonderful stuff you're saying. I, I just want to ask, you had made an analogy one time about um, when a candle is lit that you don't blow it out, you wave it out. Is that is there yes. some similarity? To yes, this? in fact, yes. Thank you for mentioning that because it's a perfect segue because in the very next paragraph, 
he talks about how we can see this with fire, how there's really one element. And, and he says something which is not always said in Kabbalah, which we need, to, we need to understand. I don't know if I can fully explain it, but he says this is true in all levels of existence as we see with fire. Although my understanding is that this is unique to fire, but I, I guess on some level it's prevalent everywhere, but we can certainly see with fire that fire flickers up and it always desires to go to trend upward. And it's symbolic of the light's desire to return to its source, which you're referring to, which is why we don't blow it out, et cetera. We, uh, we, we treat it with, with respect. Um, yeah, take a look at the next, literally the very next paragraph of this text. All right, it is, second paragraph right here. It is in the nature of things. Wait a second, hold on. I don't think that's what it says in the original Hebrew. I know it could scroll, but I don't want to give you guys vertigo with me scrolling back and forth so much. Um, page 86, okay. A second. Yeah. All right. Um, it says, uketeva kol davar. In the Hebrew, it says, the nature of all things. Here it says, it is in the nature of things, but in the original, it says, it is in the nature of all things. So that... I don't know that we see it with all things. Maybe that's why it was translated to make it a little bit more palatable, but the original says all things. So let's just go with the, the translation here. It is in the nature of things to wish to be absorbed in their source. And the example he gives is fire. Fire tends to rise to its source, which is, what is its source? The spiritual element of fire so without fuel and a wick or some other combustible or some other combustible it is impossible to contain fire fire is restless fire as we've said many times fire is volatile fire is living and breathing and moving and it's it's a, it's a very active energy but but at the core what does it want it wants to go back to its source and undo its own existence. So without something that holds it down, i.e. a fuel and a wick, right? Without fuel and, and a wick, it will burn itself out and go back to its source. So when it burns out, it's not like the fire is disappearing. The fire is returning to its spiritual state, its spiritual potential state in the element of fire, so to speak. That's what it's called, yesod ha'esh, the element of fire, which is not a physical thing. It's not like you know, some fire burning in some mountain somewhere at the top, you know, of the, of, of the world. It's, it's, um, it's a spiritual element of fire from where all fire derives. So fire knows this, the individual flame knows that it is now in a very disconnected state from its source. It thus wants to, which is why, by the way, it has to be struck into existence, right? You take a match and you strike it. You take two stones and you strike it. Fire is produced with force, and it's kind of like out of nowhere, but it's not out of nowhere. There is a spiritual potential for fire, this element of fire, from which, with the right force and the right materials, the fire jumps from its spiritual potential state to a physical form. But even as it's in this physical form, it's not content like, oh, I've made it, I've arrived. Look at me, I'm a flame. No, its consciousness is the opposite. It says, Gewalt. This is crazy. Why am I here? I would rather be in my source. And therefore it burns and burns and burns until it can undo itself, undo its physical manifestation and go back to its spiritual state as uh, absorbed within the element of fire. Therefore, we see this even while the, fl the flame is burning. Even, this is one, two, three, four lines down from this paragraph. Even when the fire or the flame is, is held by oil and wick, it constantly flutters, rising and falling, which again signifies its restlessness with its state of being. It is not content being a flame here. It is, it's pulsing in and out. It rises, it falls, it wants to go back. Likewise, so that's the, the physical example, the example that we can relate to, fire, which by the way is very similar to what we're talking about, light, you know, sun and light. But it's still the example. We're talking about spiritual, um, the spiritual um, creation here. So he says, likewise, 
the radiance that gives life to all creation, Malchut, being no more than radiance, not the source, it's just the, the ray of light, it is in a constant, so likewise, this radiance is in a constant state of Ratzo surging upward. Again, imagine the flame that is constantly flickering, trying to undo itself. Malchut, which is the diminished ray of light, the diminished form of divine radiance, which creates a more self-aware lower world, that energy itself desires to be back in the source, in the infinite light, and it surges upward. We call that state ratzo. Ratzo means yearning, desiring. It's not just yearning, because you can yearn for anything. You can yearn for uh, pizza. It's, it's an existential dilemma. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be. Yeah, Ratzo is, in, in Kabbalah, is a specific type of yearning. It's the yearning of something that doesn't want to be where it is. It wants to be elsewhere. Oh, very simple way of phrasing it. It's homesick. It's homesick. Yeah, you take a kid, you put him in summer camp, sleepaway camp for the first time. Yeah, and they might be homesick. Not all kids, right? But some kids might be homesick. And all they want to do is go back home. Right? They're in a new place, in a new environment, in a new camp, new rules, new, you know, everything is new, everything is different, new people, new food, new schedule. Some camps, I remember back in the day, at least Chabad camps, I don't know if this is everywhere, but some camps would have you actually change, your, change the time, camp time. Is that a thing in other camps or is that just Jewish Chabad camps? Is that a thing? No? They would change, like in the summer, you would, like, it would be camp time. It would be an hour off so that I think it got darker earlier so the kids would go to sleep. Anyway, it is what it is. The point is like this. The point is that a child in that environment separated from their family, separated from their home, right? Although now positioned to have their own impact and their own space, whatever, might also feel homesick. In other words, I want to go back home. I want the comfort, security, anonymity of my family. I don't want to be out in the world. I want to be back, back at home. This is how fire feels. And this is how Malchut feels. Malchut, the divine ray, the mere radiance of the larger infinite light that ultimately spawns the rest of creation, Malchut, all Malchut wants is to go back home. That is the Ratzo of Malchut. Okay, let's get back inside. Hence, right, where my mouse is, right here. One, one, two, three, four, five lines from the bottom of this paragraph. Hence, it is called Thirsty. Hence, the title of today's class also, Thirsty Light. The light, the radiance, the Malchut is called Thirsty. Always eager to rise higher as it is written. Therefore, my soul shall sing to you and not be silent. It says in Psalms, King David writes, my soul shall sing to you, God, and not be silent. What's the Hebrew? The Hebrew is, Laman chavod velo yidom. We say it in our prayers every single morning. Laman is America chavod velo yidom. Therefore, my soul shall sing to you and not be silent. What does it mean, sing? Sing is not just, yeah, I'm going to sing music. Sing is, is, is a singing is a manifestation of desire. We sing from a state of desire, from a state of wanting, a closeness. It's my soul shall sing, my soul shall rise up to you and not be silent, and not be silent with, um, with a state of complacency. My soul is not complacent, it's not silent, it's rather in a state of singing, which is this thirst, and Ratzu, this desire to rise higher. And as Kabbalah explains, this phrase, my soul, is not just King David writing about himself, but it really refers to the soul of all existence, the soul of all creation, which 
as you probably can guess by now, refers to Malchut, the ray of light, the radiant, divine radiance that forms the soul of the universe. So my soul shall sing to you and not be silent means that the soul, not of the microcosm human being, but the macrocosm of the universe, the divine soul that creates everything, the level of Malchut is always singing to God, always striving upward and never silent. As is explained, 109, I believe it's Kabbalah. Let's see the footnote. Yeah, Zohar. As explained in Kabbalah, the nether flame, the lower flame, strives ever to the higher flame and does not rest. So the lower flame always strives to become one with the higher flame and never rests in that desire, in that thirst to essentially go back to its source. Okay. So what we have so far is a beautiful explanation of what Malchut does. Sorry, what Malchut is, what Malchut does, and how Malchut feels. Right? So what Malchut is, it's the lowest of the 10 energies, the most diminished, and the the most, yeah, it's the most diminished light. What, is it, what does it do? What, what Malchut does is creates, creates the other because it's, it relates to other so it can create the other. And how does it feel? Like it wants to go home. <laughs> That's how it feels. It feels like it's separated from its source. It feels disconnected. It feels like it's not where it needs to be or not where it wants to be. So it's in a constant state of thirst. Now, the reason why thirst is such an important word is because in our discourse, if you recall from last week, we spoke about the verse from Deuteronomy that is at the key of understanding how evil prospers. And we said that there's a person who makes a calculation, I'm going to go with the dictates of my heart, Right? Shalom Yali, it's going to be, I'll have a peaceful time, a peaceful existence. Life will be good. Why? Because I'll go with the whims and dictates of my heart. In order to sefot, which we had two meanings of, either connect or add on, the sated with the thirsty. So we quoted Rashi on Tractate Sanhedrin, which says that sated Right, the one whose thirst is quenched, that refers to idolaters, idolatry. And thirsty refers to Knesset Israel, right? The congregation of Israel, which we said according to Kabbalah is not physical people, but it refers to Malchut, the energy of Malchut. Malchut thus is called thirsty. It's called thirsty based even, again, a spiritual understanding of Rashi's commentary on the Talmud that, 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 that thirsty, it refers to Knesset Yisrael, which Knesset Yisrael and Kabbalah refers to Malchut. Now we're explaining what that means. Malchut is the ray of light that creates because, it's, because it was once upon a time in the source and now it's far from the source, it thirsts and yearns for that connection, for that, for that place on high. So thus, Malchut is thirsty. All right, let's get back inside and continue the conversation and connect it with the letters of God. The letters of God's name. You know what? But before we do that, let me... How do I move this? Okay. Can you see? The, did I just change the Sphero chart? Can you see that? Did the chart just come up? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I want to give you a little bit of, uh, of a, a preface to the next part. You know, God's name, God's, um, the highest name of God that we, that we have, it, I mean, that's like typically written in scripture, is the four-letter name of God. Yud, followed by the letter He, followed by the letter Vav, followed by the letter He. Four-letter name of God. We don't, it's so holy, we don't even pronounce it the way it's written. 
So Yud, and then the letter He, and then the letter Vav, and then the letter He. Kabbalah explains, we've done this before, that these four letters of God's name correspond to the 10 energies on this chart. How so? The Yud, and you might remember this from the last text that we studied together, the Yud is Chachma. Okay, Yud, Keter we're leaving out right now. Apologies for all those Keter fans. So the Yud is Chachma. The He, the, the second letter, He is Bina. So like the shape of the letters, Yud is a little letter and He is a broader letter. So Chachma, as we've explained, we explained that length in the last text that we studied together. Chachma is the seminal point of wisdom, like the original kernel of the idea. And Bina is where it's elaborated on, where it's understood in a full measure. So like the Yud and the He, the Yud is a small letter, the He is a full, larger letter. So first Yud, Chachma, then He, Bina. The next letter in God's name is the Vav which the numerology of Vav is six. It's the sixth letter of the alphabet, of the Hebrew alphabet. That refers to the six energies that follow, the six emotive energies. Again, we're skipping that as well. So the six emotive energies that follow, Chesed, one, Gevura, two, Teferet, three, Netzach, four, Hod, five, and Yesod is six. So again, that's the Vav. So we have Chachma is Yud, Bina is He, Chesed, Gevura, Teferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod is Vav, and the final letter of God's name, the final letter, hey, is Malchut. So again, I hope this is not too confusing. We have many understandings of Malchut. Malchut is a ray of light, a mere glimmer and, and point of divine radiance. Malchut is also called speech. Malchut is also called name. And now Malchut is synonymous with the final letter He of God's name. All are true about Malchut. It's kind of like how you describe how you describe a car, right? Or a sports car. So it's fast. It's shiny. It's red, maybe. It's, I don't know, whatever, right? You would use different terms to describe it. Each of those terms could describe other things also. Fast, could also be, um, I don't know, uh, a cheetah, right? Red could be an apple. But put together, you have a picture of what, of what a thing is. So Malchut has all of these descriptors behind it. Malchut is a ray of light, just the mere glimmer of divine radiance. Malchut is um, speech, Malchut, which is revealing to the other. Malchut is name, which is for the other. Malchut is the final letter, hey, of God's name as well. So now, he says, we can understand with this piece of information that I just told you, now another thing makes a lot of sense. As you see here in the caption, it says, hey's thirst to ascend. Hey, the letter hey, is Malchut. This is the meaning in our verse of Hatzmea, the thirsty. It says, the original verse that we're focusing on in Deuteronomy is that a person will go by the whims of their heart saying, it's going to be good, right? right? Why is it going to be good? Because I'm going to just do whatever I want. Leman sefot harava et hatzmea. In order to connect the, the sated with the thirsty, hatzmea. It doesn't say with, Thirsty, the thirsty. Hey, Smeya, which again, he's now understanding this uh, mystically to mean it's the hey that thirst. Hat Smeya doesn't just mean the thirsty one, it means the hey. Hat Smeya begins with the letter hey. It really works better in the Hebrew. So if you can see the Hebrew, um, okay, if, if you're familiar with Hebrew, so this last paragraph. The word Hatzmeya is right here. And he basically divides it, separates the word Hatzmeya into two, into two words. He, Tzmeya. So Hatzmeya is really the letter He. That's the letter He right there. That, that shape is the He that is Tzmeya. It's Malchut that is the thirsty one. So Hatzmeya, the thirsty, when you break it down Kabbalistically, it's a, it, it, alludes, it's a, it's, it, it, it alludes to the secret of it's the He, the Malchut energy, 
that is ultimately the tzmea energy, the, the, the thirsty energy in existence. I hope that makes sense. Um, this is the meaning of hatzmea, the thirsty hey tzmea. The hey is that which thirsts, which hey refers to malchut, which this refers to malchut, which corresponds to the latter hey of havaya. Havaya is how we pronounce God's name by reorganizing the letters of that word of the yud kevavke, um, the four letter name of God. The latter letter hey, because there's two hey's, there's yud and then hey and then vav and then hey again. That latter hey, the last, the fourth letter of God's name, that latter letter hey. Um, is synonymous with Malchut, as we said before, in this depiction, right? Yod and He, and then Vav, and then Malchut is the He at the bottom. So that's what we're referring to. But that's what the verse, according to Kabbalah, that's what the verse refers to when it says, Hatzmeya, the He is thirsty. Malchut is in a constant state of thirst to yearn to go back to its source. Similarly, the Midrash, Rabbah, interprets bihi baram there's a verse that talks about these are the chronicles of mankind on the day that god created them bihi baram or as they were created um so the medrash says uh, the medrash re reimagines the word bihi baram as they were created as behe baram with the hey god created them again let me go back to the hebrew over here so Again, the Hebrew word is Bihibaram. Right? Bihibaram in their created state or on the day they were created. But it's the Medrash, even, it's not even Kabbalah. It reimagines it as Bihibaram. Again, you can just, if you drive a wedge within this one word, Bihibaram, you drive a wedge. This is reverse Sesame Street, right? Instead of taking parts of the word and putting it together, you're now separating it out. So bihi baram becomes behei baram with, with the hey, he created them. By the way, for those of you that maybe are not, uh, are not either not familiar with Hebrew, with reading Hebrew, or maybe it's been a while and, and it's a little bit rusty, I am planning on doing a Hebrew reading course, um, one of these power courses, like a five-week, get you either from not knowing Hebrew to knowing how to read Hebrew or from maybe uh, being a little bit rusty to getting much more polished. We have a great program called Read It in Hebrew that we're gonna, start, we're gonna launch in the next several weeks. So stay tuned for that. It's gonna be an online course. So you can take it and it comes with, uh, with, with cards and with an app, it's pretty amazing. All right, but that's, that's an, as, as an aside. So in other words, with that information, when, I'm, when, I'm, when we're reading this side, so it's, uh, it's going to be much more meaningful for everybody. Um, again, if you, uh, if you join us for that. Let's get back to, to the text. So the Midrash says, Bihibaram, as they were created, really means Behebaram, which means with the He, God created them. The world is created with the He. As we said before, the, the, the He, this latter He is Malchut, and that's how the world was created. The world was created through the letter He, Malchut, the lowest ray of light from the divine Continuing, this letter He, the creating force, is thirsty. Hatzmea, this is the thirsty energy. It co constantly longing and expiring. Expiring is a weird word, but like <laughs> wants to expire, wants to undo itself, right? And go back. Constantly longing and expiring to return to its pristine state of nothingness. In other words, the ray in the sun is not a ray anymore. It's just sun. It, it would lose itself, but that's what it wants. It wants to be absorbed within its source. Regarding this, it is said in Jeremiah, are not my words like fire? God says. What's are my words not like fire? Which means just as a fire, just as flame naturally tends to rise, as we have noted earlier. Likewise, the word of God, right? God says, my word, my words are like fire. Likewise, the word of God, which, as I said before, divine speech is malchut. Malchut is the ray of light, divine speech, name, and the letter hey, it's all of the above. So just like flame goes up, likewise, the word of God, with the letter hey, he created them, malchut, always wants to be elevated. So 
we're just reiterating what we're saying with different angles, different sources, different secrets, hidden secrets, secret verses, and, 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 and coded words and phrases throughout scripture. We've now talked about a verse that, that alludes to Malchot being be yearning from Deuteronomy, Hatzmeah. We refer to a, a, a verse from uh, Genesis 12, Bereshit 12, Bihibaram. We refer to a verse from Jeremiah. These are all scriptural verses that in their context, we can understand them in completely different ways. But through a Kabbalistic lens, they all have a, a similarity. They all use the letter He, or refer to, which refers to Malchut, or refer to speech, which is Malchut, and talk about the nature of this restlessness, either thirst or fire, which flickers up. Either way, the, the idea here is that the letter He, which is Malchut, always thirsts to ascend. Let's continue. Now, you might say, one second, how could a letter be thirsty? How could a letter be yearning for something? How could a letter be aware of who and what it is that it knows that it wants to be elsewhere? That doesn't even make sense. So he says the letters, the divine letters, are, have intelligence. Here we go. The letter, hey, in its divine state, is not, God forbid, the same as the letters of mortal speech, which have no independent will. Right, the letter hey God of, of God's name, it's not like the letters of speech that we use, which the letters, the language of speech doesn't have its own independent desire. In other words, when we speak, let's pause for a moment here and think about this. When we speak, right? So we take ideas and we put it into language and the language carries our idea to the listener right so you're thinking what are you thinking i would like to go to the park today that's what you're thinking that's in your head so then you take that thought and you tell the other person i would like to go to the park today do you want to come with me <coughs> and what that does is it transmits and conveys what you thought we're thinking about to the other person. So on that level, speech or the letters, the characters, right? If you were to transcribe that, if you were to do that into your phone and let Google or Siri or whatever it is, right, transcribe it out. So your, your sounds, your words would, would be manifest as physical letters that you could see. But even if you don't see them, you can hear them. And you can hear the letters, the letters. You can hear the L, the E, the T, T, E, R, S. You can hear the articulation of language, of letters, as someone speaks. And on that level, the characters themselves, the language itself, doesn't have its own desire, doesn't have its own will. It's not like when I say a word right to you and you're listening, that my language has its own agenda. It's completely forced, I mean, not in a negative way, but it's completely boxed into what I am giving it to then share with somebody else. So it doesn't have its own consciousness or desire or feelings. It's just a tool that I'm using to convey a message. Well, that's the way it is for human beings. Divine speech has an awareness, has an agenda, has a feeling to itself. Let's get back inside and read this for ourselves. I'm starting again from the beginning. The letter He in its divine state is not, and it was divine letter He, Malchut, is not, God forbid, the same as the letters of mortal speech, which have no independent will. Human articulation is inert, intrinsically devoid of will and wisdom. For human beings, words are merely vehicles for some power in other words, some outside power, idea, feeling, to be invested in them. So words are kind of like, another example that's given in Kabbalah is like a cup. 
right? Like a cup. So the cup, I mean, I guess it could have something else in it, but in most cases, the cup is empty and then you pour something into it. So what, is, what does it hold? It's whatever you pour into it. It doesn't have its own agenda. It doesn't have its own nature. It doesn't have its own consciousness. It doesn't have its own desire or understanding. It's a container. Whatever you pour into it, you pour into it. The same thing is true on some level with our language, with our speech, right? The power of articulation, the power of speech is like a cup that's ready for whatever you put into it. And then like a cup, it then pours it from the cup into the person, right? So there's two actions that a cup does. It's the recipient, right? First, you pour the liquid into the cup and then the cup becomes the giver. You with me, right? The cup becomes now the bestower of the liquid. So it's the recipient of the liquid. And then it becomes the bestower of the liquid. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. It receives. Right now, my cup is tea. I don't want to spill it on my computer. That would be super awkward. Um, but yeah, we have tea. I have tea. we, the royal we. I have tea in my cup. And what I did was I took, I have a hot water kettle thing. So I took the cup, I poured the hot water into it. I then made the tea, right? So that's as the cup is a recipient. And now watch as I take a sip of the cup. And now the cup is giving to me. Language is similar. We have an idea. The words don't have an idea. The idea is in our heads. So we take the idea we put it into the words, and then the words, the language, communicates with the other person. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah? So, that, so language, speech, let's just say speech. Speech is like a cup. It's a container. Something from above, right? Ideas, feelings go into it. It holds it, and then it conveys it to the other but that process is inert. It doesn't get in the way, right? It's like a cup. It doesn't get in the way. It doesn't mess it up. Whatever you put in is what's going to come out. It doesn't change it. It doesn't have its own desire. It doesn't have its own flavor. I know what you're thinking, but some cups do add a flavor. All right. We're not talking about those cups, right? This is, we're talking about a cup that just, whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. Simple. That's the way it works with human speech. Human speech, human characters, human letters, human language doesn't add to the equation or doesn't have its own awareness and consciousness and desire and feelings, etc. However, let's talk about God's speech. But God forbid, he says, this is one, two, three, four, five lines down into this paragraph, but God forbid to refer to divine speech in the same manner. The letters of divine speech are, are endowed with will and wisdom. For divine speech provides the source of chachma of the higher Gan Eden. Divine speech is malchut. Again, I told you malchut is so many different things, like a race car is red and fast and etc. So Malchut is a ray of light, not the essence. Malchut is a name and not the sort, not the essence of the, of, the, of, the of, of that being. Malchut is also divine speech. So the letters of divine speech, right, have will and wisdom for, the, for divine speech. Malchut provides the source of Chachma of higher Gan Eden. That's the Chachma of, of Bria, i.e., Malchut, of Atzilut, the lowest speech energy of Atzilut, of the higher world, becomes Atik, becomes the crown for Bria, which essentially means the source of Chachma, of Bria, of what, when Bria is, is considered to be the higher level of higher Gan Eden, Gan, the upper supernal Gan Eden, Garden of Eden. So what that means is that if, and you know, let me share this, screen once again this this depiction malchut of atzilut of the higher world becomes the atik the keter 
of the next world down and the source of Chachma and Bina and Dat, etc. So this bottom becomes the top for the next world down, which means that it spawns intelligence and understanding, creative intelligence, intellectual comprehension. It spawns all those things, which means that the letters themselves must have something in the equation, must have some sort of wisdom as well. Rabbi, the Vav um, in the yud hey vav hey, is that, you said all six lower Spiro? Or is chesed, that just- yeah, Chesed, the emotional ones. Chesed through Yisod, exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six. Chesed, Gevura, Teferet, Netzach, Hod, and Yisod. Those okay. six energies. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So he says here, that the, the letters of divine speech have will and wisdom because they create the chachma of higher Gan Eden. Let's continue. He gives more, more proof text. In Midrash Echa, we find the following quote. It says, the letters came to testify. It says, the letters came to testify before God. The letters themselves have a consciousness, have an awareness. Divine letters have an awareness. Another source, another proof. In the introduction to Zohar, Kabbalah, we find the letters appeared from whom the universe was to be created. In other words, the letters appeared and they were jostling. The way that goes is they were each vying to be the ones to create the world, the first letter to create the world. You know, every letter said, hey, I should be first, I should be first. The point is that the letters have desire, have understanding. Another source, Tukune Zohar, at the end of the introduction, comments the following. The intelligent will shine. That's the quote. The intelligent will shine. That's a quote from the book of Daniel. Daniel. It says, the, um, it says I lost my place here. One, two, three, four lines from the bottom. The intelligent will shine. And the Tikkune Zohar comments, these are the letters that have intelligence to rise before the king, each according to its positions, each according to its position. The letters have intelligence. The divine letters have intelligence. Kisei Melech states that this is why letters are called intelligent and see the, that text over there. It is possible then to state, based on all of these sources, based on everything that we just said, and I, I went through it quickly, but the point is, based on what we just said, that divine letters have intelligence and their own desires, it is possible then to state that the letter He, Malchut, the lowest letter, the, the last letter of the divine name, which corresponds to Malchut, that letter He desires to rise and expire or be sur- subsumed and dissolved within its source. Hence, Zohar states, this is powerful. At the time that she, the Shechina, oh, another euphemism. Shechina is also Malchut, okay? So at all the same level. At at the time that she, the Shechina, is in great love with her beloved, the source, from the intensity of the love that she cannot tolerate, in other words, it's so much love she can't even handle it, she shrinks herself greatly until nothing is seen of her. But only, oh man, why is it so cropped like this? But only one, but one tiny dot. And what is it? A yud. I'm going to explain this quote. I.e., that is, the hay becomes a yud, and the yud represents hay's inclusion with nothingness when it becomes subsumed within its source. Let's go back to this. It's really powerful. It says, when the Shekhinah, the divine presence, in other words, the light that goes into the worlds, i.e. Malchut, which is the letter He, which is name, which is divine speech, all of the above. So when the Shekhinah is in a state of great love and yearning for her source, the beloved, her beloved, the source, So from the great intensity of the love that she cannot tolerate, she moves from being a hey, in other words, its own, her own thing, its own light, its own being, 
and it shrinks, it diminishes, it undoes itself until nothing is seen of her but one tiny dot. And what is that? The yud. That's how the hay dissolves into a yud. And the yud represents as it dissolves into the source and becomes nothing. So all of this speaks to the fact that the hay, malchut, is thirsty, is yearning to go back to its source. Now, why is this relevant to us? <laughs> it's relevant to us to understand the mechanism by which the worlds unfold and by which we got here. In other words, the foundation of our existence, our existence, we're at the bottom end of all of these successive you know, um, mechanisms. So we got here by virtue of the light being diminished, malchot emerging and descending into one world, and then the malchot of that world descends into the next world, and the malchot of that world descends into the next world, and then we got here. Our existence is thus predicated on array of array of array of array. There's four worlds. Right, our energy and vitality in this world is a ray of the ray, is the this malchut of that malchut of that malchut is a ray of a ray of a ray of a ray. So it's understandable that we have a very limited going through the normative formula of how the energy moves through the worlds. What we get on this side is very limited light, very limited light. What if you could somehow jump outside of this formula and grab the source light? You would be getting a lot more, a lot more energy, a lot more light. Ultimately, and again, we're not going to do this for another few weeks, so hang tight with this. We have to first develop all this groundwork first. Again, imagine if instead of going through this normative light diminishing, diminishing, malchot, ray, etc., imagine if instead of that, you can cut out all that stuff and go to the source and grab the big light. It would be the ultimate heist, right? Instead of getting the money from your bank account through your ATM, you go to the vault and get, and get the source, get the gold, right? I don't know if there's gold in the vault, but you get, uh, right? You get from the source. That's ultimately what we're going to say about evil, how evil, and we need to understand how this is possible, how evil sometimes could have the power, the ability to go and get from, bypass the normative limitations of the system, hack into the source, and get a windfall that is not appropriate for its standing, but is, uh, is, is nonetheless um, accessible in some devious ways. This is what we're going to talk about ultimately, but we're not there yet. First, we're establishing the normative protocol, the normative flow of energy through the worlds. And a key to that is malchut, this energy that is the lowest of whatever world it's in, the most diminished light, which then faces forward to the next level. But it itself is conflicted because it has a job to do, which is keep the light moving forward, create the next world down. But it, by nature, wants to go back to its source. It is thirsty for its origin. I just want to end off this class with a personal, I don't mean personal, personal, but I mean with a, a practical application of this, a little bit you know, pulled out of context, practical um, um, uh, application. Our souls are created in a very similar model. Our souls descended from above and now find themselves here on earth, in our body, stuck in whatever challenges, we're all, we all have challenges stuck in, in, in our individual spaces. And the soul is conflicted. On the one hand, it knows that it has a job to do, to give the, this body life and to drive this person, hopefully in the right direction. On the other hand, the soul would rather be back home, would rather not be here because it's so much harder here than it is back in the source. And its power and its love and its intensity, its spirituality is far diminished here on earth 
at least in an obvious and apparent way, than as it was above in its source. And so the soul also wants to return to the source. But the soul knows that even as it desires source, it desires to surrender to, to source, it has a mission. And so each and every day, let us remind ourselves. Let us have a soul meditation. If you're wondering what meditation to do, perhaps before davening, before prayer each morning, this might be a meditation to have in the repertoire, in the, um, you know, in the, in the bullpen, to, have, to, to pull out on occasion. It's the meditation of the soul. My soul originated from on high. And she was sent down to a lowly environment, a place where there's corruption and evil and darkness and pain and suffering. And she is a pristine piece of God. A soul is a chelik loka, mimal mamash. Soul is literally a piece of God. And the soul is sent into this space. And it's tremendously painful for the soul. But why is it here? It's here not for its own benefit, but to bring even a glimmer, even a little bit of light into a dark space. And so we think about, we meditate on the fact that my job today is to give my soul an outlet to do her job. Let's not make it more frustrating for the soul. Let's not stir the soul's desire to get out, but let's give the soul an outlet to share her vision, her light with the world, with my body and with the world at large. That's a great way to start the day. That I have a peace, I have a light of God inside of me that by its nature wants to go back, but has a purpose here. And all I need to do really is not get in the way, right? All I need to do, the soul's already here inside of me. All I need to do really is not block it and allow for her expression to shine forth. May we indeed give our soul expression. And uh, may this week be a week of, of inspiration for all of us and for the world at large. And may we keep on journeying this journey of life in a successful, safe fashion and fulfill our purpose of being light makers in this world. And let us say, Amen. Thank you for joining me today for Kabbalah and Coffee. I hope this resonated. Next week, we continue our journey with understanding the challenge of Malchut. Not only is this ray of light, you know, far removed from its source, but it then powers a world in which evil sometimes is perpetrated. Can you imagine the pain of the light as it's enlivening a reality that is going against everything it stands for? We're going to get into this, the pain of Malchut, the pain of the Shekhinah. The exile, Galut, the exile of the Shrina, as it comes into our world specifically and encounters the challenges of our reality. That is all next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. But one announcement before we close out today. That is, we have a new course starting this week called This Can, not never, This Can Happen. This Can Happen is all about the Jewish perspective on Mashiach, the Messianic era. It is one of the, the core principles of Judaism that this, that this world will become perfected, will become a better world for all of humanity. It's a core fundamental Jewish belief that has literally driven centuries, millennia of Jews and, and really Judaism itself. So in this six-week six journey, we're going to explore what is at the heart of Judaism's understanding of Mashiach. What is the belief? How does it work? What does it mean? Is it really possible? Is this a pipe dream? Why do we need it if things are relatively good? And, and, and how can we see that over the course of history, we've been moving into the right trajectory for a better time? In a world that so often feels so dark and dim without any hope for the future, this course is a fierce reminder of Judaism's unrelenting belief in a better future for all of us. So if you're into better futures, if you're into lights at the end of the tunnel, if you're into 
glasses that are half full, or if you want to be into that, if you want to learn more about Judaism's take on the Messiah, then join me for this six-week journey. It's going to be incredible. As some of you may know, I wrote one of the lessons, and you'll guess, you'll have a chance to guess which lesson I wrote specifically. I'm not going to tell you yet. Um, but that is starting this week. We have two options, a Zoom option, an in-person option. Zoom Tuesday nights at 8, in-person Thursday afternoons at 12. So that those are the two options. If you're not sure, you're not really sure yet what the course is going to be about or if you're going to like it, try out the first class free of charge. Just go to the website in town jewishacademy.org choose free course trial you'll get onto the first class you'll try it out you see if you like it try before you commit and if you like it you'll join us if it's not for you it's not for you but i can't imagine it's not for you being that all human beings want a world of peace and 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 uh, and happiness this course is all about a positive vision for the future and how to make that in the present. All right. Thank you for joining me today for Kabbalah and Coffee. Um, let me check the comments. I saw some stuff pop up. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Mariana. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. I, I, I cry. I cry. Really. It's it's so deep. And uh, it's, it's amazing how you, you share the light to us and to the world. I'm, I'm very touched. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you. Sending lots of love from all of us here in Atlanta. Lots of love to you guys. To so the home. Thank Baca. you. Thank you very much. The same, the family there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great to see everybody. I'm David. I see Linda. Glad that you enjoyed it. And beautiful, beautiful. And David is guessing. Oh, David, direct message to me is guessing which, which lesson I wrote. David, you got the, the textbook already? You got it. Okay. Um, all right. Hold your guesses and uh, we'll see as we unfold um, which one I actually wrote, but it's really Am I a, close. A, I mean, you're, you got a one out of six shot. So yeah, you're close. I mean, Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell you yes or no yet, right. even in a private message. I'm still creating a, um, the mystery um, at least after the first class. I'm not going to divulge anything. Um, what else did I want to mention? Yeah, okay. So that's it. Stay tuned for more exciting announcements that are coming up. We have um, some really, really exciting things that are happening. Some holiday celebrations. Lagba Omer and Shavuot is coming up. Two holidays that are really beautiful celebrations. We also have, um, anyway, we have some more stuff. So stay tuned, but join me this week for the hope and the belief and the promise of a better future. We all need it. All right, we'll see you all soon. Have a wonderful day. Shavua Tov and Amen. lots of blessings, lots of light. We'll see you all soon. Thank Take care, you, everybody. Rabbi. Shavua Tov. All right, lots of love to everybody.